if you want to get a lot of people very angry at you and you're in the health profession, it's fairly simple. Begin to cure incurable diseases. It would ruin the economy. Billions of dollars. And we live in a medical dictatorship. The big pharma, the huge med, uh, pharmaceutical companies that make billions on cancer, have everybody in their pocket, from the president on down to the senator's representative. Everybody gets paid. And of course, it's the pharmaceuticals would lose a lot of money because we're getting people healthy with a non-patentable process, with non-patentable foods, eating something that you don't have to buy from a pharmaceutical company, and uh, that's not something that they want to do. And they can do that legally because that industry is so powerful, it owns the lobbyists, they own the politicians, they're the ones that create and put into play the policies of health care. I'm not making this up. This is real. They run the FDA, the TGA. They do. By their own admission. By their own admission. Many patients come to me because their doctor has given them a death sentence. Well, can you imagine what program that is into a patient's head? Correct, and it is precisely mind over matter why so many people die. If the doctor tells them, hey, you're dead in six months, and you buy that in your mind, the patients die. You start killing your patient with the lack of hope. Out of the thousands of people I've spoke to, many have said that they've been rushed into treatment immediately, sometimes having surgery as soon as the very next day. And there has been little discussion, if any at all, about what their choices are and how to actually heal their body from cancer. They are being told that they got to start the chemotherapy immediately, like yesterday, not even today or tomorrow, or they're going to die soon. Yeah, that's closing the sale. They're, these doctors are like storm windows and storm door salesmen, citing, you know what I mean? Oh, you got to do this right away, man. This will save your life. This is a widow maker, you know, that type of thing. Uh, they lie. Uh, there was a study in Göttingen in Germany uh, some years ago where they had women over 80 years of age with breast cancer. 50% of these were operated and had radiation. The other 50% were sent home without any kind of treatment. And uh, who lived the longest? Those who had no treatment at all lived averagely 11 months longer than those who were treated. I can't tell you how many of my clients come to me and have had mastectomies. That's the removal of the breast, or double mastectomies. When there is no research that there is any life extension removing the breast, and these women are scarred for life. That's how medieval conventional medicine is. The program says that you're not the professional. You don't know about your health. You don't have anything to do with it. It's the professional's opinion that controls your health. Well, then think about it this way. If the professional says that you can't do anything about it, and your belief system has bought into that, then 95% of your habit mind, your subconscious mind, is going to fulfill what the doctor just said because you've already attributed the doctor as the profession, professional in charge of your health. So many people think that their doctors know what they're doing. No, they only know what the pharmaceutical industry trained them to know and do. You can't help somebody if they're not open-minded. You can't help somebody if they know their doctor's right, regardless of the fact that their doctor's wrong. 
And in many cases, doctors can be correct. It's just that when it has to do with um, drug-based medicine and cancer, most of what they're taught is wrong. What we have is an upside-down system in which everybody has this Western idea that there's a drug and we'll have a label for everything. And so the system is badly out of control. Five-minute office visits in which Groupman, who's been the head of internal medicine at Harvard, one of our brighter doctors in the United States, bestseller, his book is called How Doctors Think. And it's frightening because they've proven by eye tracking that within six seconds your doctor is not hearing a word that you say. He's already decided within six seconds how to get you out of his office and what he's putting into your hand to, to have completed that visit and have his records bulletproof in case you happen to die. He's doing what everybody else did. I'm not saying there aren't sincere people within that industry. There are. But the sad part is oftentimes we can be sincerely wrong. And so the doctors, well, let's be fair, very, very often go into medicine with a desire to help people get well. Don't even understand how much of what they're doing is harming their patient more than helping it. Something's terribly wrong when you treat cancer, the most dreadly disease, and your hair falls out, and you regurgitate, you vomit. This is astounding. This is truly medieval. Many years from now, people look back at this time and, and wonder what kind of Neanderthals we were. We are. And the problem is, the deeper you get into it, and get into the real published studies, you find out that cancer isn't even the enemy. You find out that people in the United States and developed countries who are treated for cancer don't even die of cancer. They die of the treatment of cancer. People don't want to hear the truth. Nevertheless, it's the truth. We commit doctors to follow a procedure and a practice based on an academic awareness that is now dated. And we put the doctor in a very rough place because a doctor can many times have an insight, yes, uh, yes, your mind and your lifestyle are very important, but I am bound by my standard practice to follow whatever the standard procedure is. And that is where we have a rate limiting step where health uh, profession is behind leading-edge science because it takes 15 or 20 years for leading-edge science to penetrate and change the academics of medicine. For many years I didn't think that people knew what made them sick, what caused cancer, but I've since come to realize that they do understand about diet, the environment, toxins, even emotions in the mind. But it's just too hard for them to change, to become responsible and become proactive participants in changing their life. Well, you know, our environment, our internal, our household environment is a major source of some big problems. We get greater toxic exposure from within our house than from without our house. So think about that. We get more toxic exposure by what we're cleaning our house with, what we're putting on ourselves, what we're spraying, what we're freshening the air with, what we are exposed to through the, the world of the EMFs, all the wireless devices, all the electrical devices, which is creating a condition called dirty electricity, which is impacting our body. Um, there are things that we bring into our home that are outgassing chemicals. Our our computers are outgassing PVDE, a flame retardant. That's, they built it into the computers. When it heats up, it outgasses. We have you know, synthetic flooring, it outgasses. We have um, clothing that's impregnated with this flame retardant that we are outgassing or wearing and gets into our bodies. We're putting on lotions and makeup and chemicals on a daily basis and then we have air pollution and heavy metals and you know, you know household cleaners a number of toxins were overloaded 
we're surrounded. There's no escape. And who has not heard that fast food is highly toxic? And 100% related to all degenerative diseases lives either in a cave or is so numbed by all the toxins that they don't realize the danger anymore. Everybody eats food and none of us eat a perfect diet and eventually it catches up with us. You are what you eat. You eat junk and your body is junk. You know, literally everything in the center portion of the supermarket is almost all unhealthy. All toxins like MSG, aspartame, food colorings, food preservatives, they are found all guilty of having devastating effects on our body and they are all highly addictive. I mean, anything that's been heated above about 45 degrees Celsius, um, even for a short period of time or extended period of time, is dead from enzymatic level. And for the most part, a lot of the nutrients in that food have been uh, d deplenished. Uh, up to 80% up to of the nutrients have been uh, depleted in foods that have been heated. So um, fresh, uncooked, raw, whole, natural, organic foods have these range and spectrum of nutrients in place and have the enzymes in place as well. And, and enzymes are really important because they help take the nutrients out of the food into the cells of the body. So if you don't have any enzymes, uh, it's very difficult for your body to get those nutrients in the places that need it the most. Each fruit and vegetable that is a whole organic fruit and vegetable has enough enzymes in it, already in it, say an apple. That apple has enough enzymes in it for our body to digest it without having to take out anything physically from the bank that we were born with. When we cook our food and we overprocess our food and we cook that apple, that apple no longer has its enzymes, the living enzymes in it for our body to naturally digest it. So the body has to take its enzymes stored in that little bank to digest that particular apple. So when you think about being 40 years old and all of the processed junk that we eat and eating the standard American diet and not having any enzymes in the food, the bank's running empty. The bank is on low and in many cases there's nothing left in the bank. Now, plastics are the number one pollutant in man today. Bisphenol A is one of the major causes of prostate and breast cancer. You just touch plastic and bisphenol A exudes. Many of the chemicals found in the environment, the chemicals found in all plastic bottles, the plastic lining of tin cans, dental sealants, this is called bisphenol A. And bisphenol A is ubiquitous in the environment. If you are eating anything out of a can or drinking any water out of a bottle, you probably have bisphenol A going into your body. And bisphenol A is a very potent hormone disruptor. It's, a, it's an endocrine disruptor. It acts as estrogen. It is proven that plastics cause cancer, cause heart disease, and cause diabetes, and most likely obesity. They're gumming up all the cells the, of the, of the the membrane of every cell in our body. They're gumming them up, they're replacing that nice membrane of every cell, the trillions of cells in our body that have over 50,000 receptor sites on there. And it's causing tremendous medical problems. Sherry Tenpenny and Dr. Eisenstein are two websites that along with Mercola have done a lot to bring the knowledge base up so that people understand the complexities of the vaccination. The, the two sides would be A, that not well proven to do any benefit and increasingly admitted to do harm. So, I mean, since I'm not allowed to kill people, I don't know why vaccine people should be, but they have a special law in this country that says they can kill and the government will pay for all the dead bodies. This is fact. They have no liability at all. So they have no incentive to try to upgrade. Their incentive is to try to get money. So they're gonna keep selling the same crap. It's conceivable that vaccines could one day actually work without having to kill people.
but it would take somebody having a real need, which would be to, they didn't want to pay for the dead bodies. Uh, vaccines all have uh, a variety of chemicals and preservatives in there. The most notorious one happens to be mercury, which is uh, called thimerosal, which is used as a preservative. And mercury is a neurotoxin that has devastating consequences to our health and absolutely is a heavy metal that drives cancers and certainly hormone dependent cancers. When you get diagnosed with cancer, you wake up to the fact that you're being poisoned and you really want to survive, so you become conscious. See, toxins were unheard of in 1930. And if you look at the graph of the introduction of toxins, approximately 1930 and really in 1940 to 2010, there's over 83,000 toxins allowed in the environment. They're allowed to be used every single day on our bodies, on babies. The Google called 10 Americans is enough to depress anybody. In seven minutes you will learn what is in the average blood of every child born in America today at birth. So they found the names of the neurotoxins, the endocrine disruptors, and the names of all of the neurotoxins and carcinogens that are in everybody at birth. The baby is a wastebasket for the mother. So all the toxins concentrate in the baby. So whatever mercury she has in her fillings, whatever she's breathing, whatever she has in her diet, and you cannot escape. Okay, we're talking, have we done the testing on one chemical? Have we done the testing of the synergistic potential of 200 chemicals, of 10 chemicals in a human body? So bottom line, we are all poisoned. We're on a poisoned planet and we're not going to enjoy optimal health unless we do something about that. And what are we going to do? Wait for the nuclear bomb to hit us one day and say, oh my gosh, now it's, it's, we have to do something? With the many people that I've spoken to, there's rarely one that hasn't suffered come some kind of emotional trauma previously whether that's fear, loss, depression, anxiety, but it's something that orthodox medicine rarely considers. And yet we know that these conditions, this emotional response, suppresses the immune system. We know that denied hopelessness precedes cancer. There's some kind of an emotional event uh, or a period of stress, emotional stress that went on for weeks or months sometimes, or it could be an event like the loss of a child or the, a difficult divorce, uh, taking care of an elderly relative with Alzheimer's, things that stress people beyond their normal stress, um, daily stress. Uh, this produces cortisol, which uh, you may be familiar with. It's a uh, hormone produced by our endocrine system to cope with stress. It's a very acid substance, and when you get cortisol in your body, you make it more, uh, more friendly to cancer cells because they like an acid environment. And of course, it challenges your immune system to where it's, it's weaker than it should be. And the cancer will get out of control where it may not have otherwise. Yes, and this has been even shown in experiments. The bullying, for example, that if you do that constant with people, you can see that the levels of the cortisol, the own production of the cortisol in the body rises, and we know that cortisol suppresses the immune system. It's okay to feel all the feelings. It's very healthy to feel everything, you know, anger, frustration, sadness, everything. But when it becomes chronic, when it becomes the only thing they feel, then there's something wrong. There's no flexibility in that system and we need to create that flexibility. Because we assume if there's some chronic, uh, unhealthy emotional state that people continue to feel and experience over time, that it's going to be important for them to look at the beliefs that are driving that emotional state.
There's a number of patients that don't want to make it, and they use cancer as their checkout point. The most important question is, do you want to live and do you have the desire to live? Then I can proceed. Otherwise, uh, it's hard to proceed. But everybody wants to live. No, no, no. Not every person has a desire to live. No. Some people say, you know what, I'm tired and I've lived my life and I'm going to do what I'm going to do. You have patients like that. I have enough people where we have helped reverse disease without reversing the things that are going lousy in their life that I know that what it does is it knocks things down and therefore it could be the whole reason somebody dies. We are constantly getting rid of micro diseases and cancer every single day. Each one of us has 750,000 cancer cells in us and our immune system is either going after it or it's not and there becomes an imbalance in the system. But we're all fighting some kind of micro diseases and cancers every single day of our life. We get cancer cells occurring, uh, cancers, precancers, weird, not abnormal cells. We get them uh, to occur in our bodies and the immune system is catching them, it's killing them. Just like it's uh, uh, catching and killing uh, bacteria and yeast and we're, we're exposed to a lot of bacteria and viruses and so on that a good immune system can eliminate. There is a tipping point where the cancer overwhelms the immune system and, and forms a tumor because most people don't understand that a t cancer tumor is tissue that has been built by the body to surround and wall off malignant cancer cells from the rest of the body. You know, the cancer cells can't build tissue. They're pretty stupid. You know, they don't know what to do except divide out of control forever. But the body's very smart and it says, oh, whoops, my immune system is not doing what it's supposed to do and controlling these cancer cells. They've gotten out of control temporarily. So I will wall them off with tissue, which forms a tumor. And then, of course, this is detectable because it'll grow gradually as the cells inside it divide out of control. But why does the tumor occur? Well, it occurs because the immune system, which is desi designed to take care of cancer cells, which grow in our body every day, has been overwhelmed. Imagine a scale. On one side, you have a T leukocyte, a white blood cell, which is representing your immune system. And on the other side, you have a cancer cell representing the tumor load in your body. And smack in the middle, you put a brain cell and we call him Brainy. Now, Brainy decides with all his actions, thoughts, feelings, diet, whatever he does, whether he supports cancer and weakens the immune system or whether he supports the immune system and weakens and reduces the cancer load. And it's that simple. But guess what? No one wants to know that. Cancer is one of the richest multi-billion dollar industries in the world. And there's no focus on what is working, what has been used sometimes for hundreds or thousands of years. So if we found this cure for cancer right now, this multi-billion dollar industry would fail. You ask an oncologist what causes cancer, they say, well, the sun and cigarette smoking, and then we don't know. But we in integrative and alternative medicine know because we're reversing it by getting rid of what causes it. Pull out the poisons, feed the body, and God will heal. It's amazing how much uh, metastasized cancer, where the cancer doctors have given up completely, has healed itself with the proper changes in diet and supplements. And of course, dealing with the cause of the cancer, which is essential. Um, you rarely can ever reverse cancer without dealing with the cause. And this is why it's so important for people to understand 
why this happened to them because in my opinion it seemed very logical that if you understand what caused something you reverse that and obviously uh, the situation should get better. We will have to peel the onion and uncover what the source of your issue is. People don't want to wake up and realize what's going on. It means they would have to change. It means that they would have to learn to respond, to develop the ability to respond, which is personal response ability. And we don't want to face that. When I started lecturing to audiences about the nature of the new biology, sometimes I ended my lectures with a conclusion that was very obvious from the data, and that is we are personally responsible for controlling our own health. I was very shocked at how the audience would respond. Most of them were very upset that I could come to that conclusion, even though the data revealed that was absolutely true. And I would have to say, why are we so uh, upset with the concept of responsibility? And the answer is, because we have been programmed from childhood to own that we are victims of a world. That what happens to us is not anything with our responsibility. Our belief system is completely tuned into the reality that we are passive recipients of our health and our lives. That things happen to us. And when you believe this as a truth, of course it's very upsetting then to hear a completely different picture that no, it is our responsibility. And yet the issue is, how are we going to get out of this? And the answer is, get over it. <laughs> we have to get over the misprogramming that genes control our lives, that forces outside of us control our lives, because the new science reveals this is absolutely untrue. What if you don't even get cancer? What if you cause it? You're not walking through the airport one day and somebody coughed on you and you came down with cancer. If you've been diagnosed with a chronic illness, it didn't come out of the blue. It didn't just strike you, an innocent victim, all of a sudden. You have been brewing conditions inside your body and psyche for probably decades. After you have the lump bump stage, you've had that thing for seven years. And, and that's by the time it's big enough for me as a radiologist to say, yeah, that's lung cancer, let's work it up. That's, it's been growing there all that time. And during that time, all I needed to do was lower your stress, maybe settle the war with your wife, or settle, get a different job, or change. I mean, across the board, the body-mind, it works on all levels. If we're ignorant because our teachers never gave us this information, then we have been operating all our lives from ignorance. And therefore, I can't be responsible if nobody gave me the story of how it worked. But once we know the story of how it works, then responsibility must set in. Because once you know, now you are responsible. When I took responsibility for my stuff, that gave me power. You know? Because then I can do something about it. If it's coming at me from the outside all the time, and it's, I'm totally not in control, that, ooh, that's overwhelming. I have no power in it. I am powerless. Taking on responsibility is not that easy. Many patients we've talked to say it's not even an option. Lifestyle changes are really the most difficult to achieve. And it is convincing the patient that unless he does change his lifestyle, he's not going to make it. And in the case of cancer, I haven't felt that empowered. I have had patients who said, I'm going to go right on smoking, I'm going to live at McDonald's, and I'm going to have my 10 Cokes a day. And I say, have a nice life. I don't want to be involved because I don't like to be part of a failure. So I don't take on cancer patients that will not do the total program. Yeah. There's a lot of healthy, unhealthy people out there. What I'm trying to say is that there's a lot of people that know everything, but don't, don't exactly do it. And that's, that's a problem you have when you have, uh, you're talking about having depression. I mean, you might know how to eat healthy, you might know what's right for you, but you're like, I just want to eat these chips and sit on the couch and zone out, you know. And 
that's that's a really difficult challenge to have someone shift from knowing it and not doing it over to doing it because action is really the the, the mother of change. You know, that's, you need to do it in order to get the results you're after. It's interesting, isn't it? You know, most of us will do everything in our power to avoid the pain of personal change. We would rather avoid the pain of change than get to the pleasure of the result we really seek. Have you ever wondered why so many people go orthodox first before they go into holistic cancer treatment? The answer is fairly simple. We all know how hard changes. You know, New Year's resolution we popped, losing weight which we didn't manage over years, stop smoking, all the things that we've planned to change in our life which are still the same as we started out with. And that really makes the answer. If I show you a magic red pill, which solves all your problems. Yeah, your hair falls out, you vomit, you feel sick, you're depressed, your psyche is completely depressed by the chemical reactions of the tablet. You feel absolutely crap and horrible, but it's convenient. You just take the tablet and you don't need to do anything else. Well, on the other side, a holistic doctor will ask you to exercise, to sweat, to change your diet, to breathe, to live a healthy lifestyle, which means a lot of changes. And that's why every single person will always first consider the magic red pill before they consider change of lifestyle, to change those things which make them sick. You, if, if, if you believe that, that this is going to kill you, it will. And so it, uh, for, for us, our mission is to convert through information, through hope and through love, our patients from victims into victors of cancer. And, and being a victor of cancer is a decision, n n not, not a happening. What would be the word? Yeah, it's a decision. You can decide today, if you have cancer, you can decide today that you are a victor. That no matter what happens to you, you're going to be victorious over cancer. The power is within the human being. It's, the power is within, within everyone to do this. In fact, you know, years ago I came up with cancer is curable now. What are we waiting for? We're always waiting for something else that it's going to be curable when, you know? Well, it's going to be curable when we understand that it's curable right now. You know, inside our cells and the decision to get well is a personal decision that can be strengthened and grown and developed with confidence and that by so doing, it's like deciding to get married. You make plans, you get your dress, you get the caterer, you know, there are things that really start to line up. And it's the same thing with making a decision to get well. Things start to line up. I think every problem, every discomfort is absolutely an opportunity to overcome the ignorance of our academically indoctrinated minds and lifestyles and begin to look at new possibilities. A disease such as cancer is not a punishment. A disease such as cancer is a reflection of a belief system. Until you get the cancer, you don't know what that belief system is. The manifestation of the cancer is not that, oh my God, I'm being punished for something. It's just a reflection that your belief systems are not supporting you. So rather than blaming your issues on the cancer, it is far better to understand the cancer is a mirror. It's just telling you that whatever way you are living, whatever beliefs you are living by, are not supportive. So then, rather than going out and damning the cancer and blaming the cancer and getting angry at the cancer, it actually should be taken in a completely different attitude. The cancer is your wake-up call. The, the real gift is it's a wake-up call that we have to change, and we have to change right now, and we have to change profoundly, and we have to change permanently. Cancer patients have to change their, 
lifestyle. They have to, uh, you are now there in your inner environment when you've got cancer, so you have to change this in, uh, inner environment. You have to change something. You can start going, learning Italian on an evening course. You can make, whether uh, here in New Zealand, this bumpy jump, or whatever it's called. You can go mountain climbing, you can do a lot of funny things, but you should change something in your life when you get cancer, for sure. Maybe you should buy a new house, maybe you should buy a new husband, <laughs> or whatever. But, but you should change something in your, in your life, for sure. The easiest way to change something in your life is to find a support team. A team which gives you confidence, certainty, and enough knowledge to stand up against this greedy system which does not want you to think. Can you imagine anywhere else in your life where you just employ the first person that you were sent to? If you were to employ an architect to help design your house, you'd interview them, you'd find someone who fitted with the style, the budget, and that would meet your needs. And your doctor or the practitioners that you choose to work with is just the same. If the doctor is not your partner and is not open-minded to everything that could possibly help that patient, then that's not the person you want to be with. If he goes, oh, no, no, you can't take vitamins. Oh, no, 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 diet doesn't matter. Well, we know in 2010 that diet and nutrition matters because every magazine on the planet, every, there's been book after book after book, research, validation, oh, you know, beyond, okay? Just on fish oils, there's over 30,000 published research articles. And you tell me that nutrition doesn't matter? Okay, so if someone tells you that, if a doctor tells you that, that is uh, uh, something is not right there. Every day you read science news, there's breakthroughs every day. So whatever your doctor is telling you is his opinion, and the second opinion is useful, but the third opinion is probably more useful, because by that time you're getting used to the music and you can hear it better. Now, if you're looking for a clinic, or a hospital or the clinical setting where you want to get your cancer treated. They need to be addressing you in a complete fashion. I tell people, cancer is not a disease of a body part. It's a disease of the body. Your terrain is in disequilibrium. The body is out of balance. So they must address your human condition, mentally, emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually, every facet, because that is what is required. And the, the single best thing I can do to empower the public is very simple. I have never seen a patient in 20 years without turning on a tape recorder, digital, and then I get their email address, or if they don't have one, I will turn it out to, and they know everything I have said to them in our consultation, whether it's phone or elsewhere. And that, of course, 99% of American doctors may be afraid, but we have to break the barrier. Mm -hmm. Patients have to start saying, I am shopping for a second opinion. I need to be able to hear what you said. My wife has to hear it, and my girlfriend or my mistress in Mexico wants to hear it too, so I got to be able to email it to her. A prophet many years ago, Jewish prophet, his name was Hosea, and he said, my people perish for lack of knowledge. I feel boy, strongly that uh, after all this 10 years of talking to cancer patients, the only reason people die of cancer anymore in the world is lack of information. And then it's getting back to common sense. It's getting back to our innate wisdom. I mean. Un lifting the veil of things is really just getting back to the wisdom that we all have before we've kind of been lulled into this, uh, you know, sleep stage. So we have to all wake up again. But what we want some patients to do is we want to pick up on what Ralph Moss has been trying to spread the word about, which is what I send my doctors to keep them 
doing an informed consent so that patients know they didn't give up anything when they walked away from that fully insurance reimbursed quackery called chemo that would have taken them out of the opportunity of thinking for themselves during that year that they continue to die or that nonsense that the doctor cut out all the tumor so they can wait for 10 years till it explodes in their face throughout their whole body. Any time during that 10 years, all they had to do is do the simple blood test at American Metabolic Testing Laboratories of ultra-sensitive HCG and phosphohexisomerase that would have been elevated. And they could say, I don't think I got it all. I better see what the other things I do so I keep my cancer at bay so I die of something like being shot by a jealous husband or something intelligent. Recently, uh, cardiovascular surgeon Dean Ornish in California has revealed a very interesting study on genes. He looked at uh, a, a, a whole series of prostate cancer patients, and instead of giving them conventional medical treatment, he helped them by changing their lifestyle, giving them a better diet, giving them processes to meditate, turning, turning their stress responses into more favorable responses, just giving them a way to handle life. What was very interesting is, after several months of just changing the lifestyle and behavior, he looked at the genetic readout of the patients and compared it to the genetic readout before he started the process. He found that 500 genes change their readout simply by changing lifestyle. Healing cancer has nothing to do with giving a medicine. If you teach a patient how to avoid toxins, how to detoxify the body, how to replenish the deficiencies, and how to live a healthy, happy lifestyle, you will always succeed. And that's what all the clinics and doctors do which we have visited. They help their patients to deal with life. They remove the stressors, they power boost the immune system, and they support the self-healing mechanism, and so even reverse end-stage cancers. I've studied medicine now for 34 years, and we have treatments for cancer that are astounding. Even end-stage cancers are reversible using the system of alternative and integrative medicine, using the best of both worlds. Yes, you can heal so-called chronic degenerative diseases, so-called incurable diseases. These are supposed to be incurable. Yes, you can heal so-called genetic diseases. It's not a big problem. We've done it. We've got lots of those patients recovered. We have a number of patients whom we cured who are now surviving not only over five years cancer-free, but over 10 or even over 20 or 25 years cancer-free from advanced cancer, metastatic cancer. Cancer, the most severely advanced degenerative change of the body, the most serious damage to all the body systems and defenses. If that's reversible, then all the other chronic diseases are reversible, and it's true. That's what we are seeing. We are, for many cancer patients, in that uh, situation today where they really can live for many years. Most of our patients have spreading to the liver. You mean you can heal it when it's in the liver? Absolutely. Once the body heals, it heals. And this brings us right back to where we started, self-responsibility. And yes, I'm afraid we're going to have to go there. It cannot be avoided because things like chemo, radiation and surgery may reduce the imminent threat. But the answer lies within your body's innate ability to heal. The human body is such a wonderful, beautiful organism. It's so finely tuned. It has such a tremendous power of defenses. If you injure yourself, you burn yourself, you cut yourself, and God forbid you have a fall and you break a bone, and it'll heal. Or 
somebody comes and breathes some germs at you and then you get a cold or you get a flu or you have some other bug biting you, infection, the body heals. This ability to heal cannot be purchased. You can't buy it over the counter. No doctor can prescribe it. You can only cultivate it with ink. The first treatment everybody with cancer has to implement into their daily life is exercise. It's free of charge and absolutely critical for your recovery. It's killing cancer cells, it's stimulating the immune system. Exercise reduces cancer 50%, okay? It's absolutely, it's not optional. It's not optional. It's mandatory. We know that exercise is chemotherapy without side effects. <laughs> Sunshine. Sunshine passing in to the eyes helps the brain develop the neurochemistry of a solid fabric of emotions. Sunshine and the photons of that light energy overcomes depression. All kinds of mental problems can be remissed by getting into the sunshine. Vitamin D is, is a huge thing that helps with, with cancer risk and, and multiple sclerosis and so many things. Um, so in the last couple of years, um, we started supplementing with vitamin D. Uh, but all of a sudden studies say, wait a minute, but if we take so much vitamin D, uh, we see increased arterial, arterial uh, uh, calcification. We see increased arterial stiffness. Uh, the lifespan um, is, is shorter if your levels of vitamin D are high. How, how is this so good for you if, if uh, up, uh, on the upper levels we see all the side effects? Now all of a sudden we're realizing, well, we need vit adequate vitamin K because as, as we take a lot of vitamin D in, the calcium that's brought in, it's not directed properly to the bone and where it's supposed to go, and it goes into the arterial wall. Uh, vitamin K, it was known to be just important for clotting. Now we know it's very important to reduce cancer risk, cancer progression. It helps the cancer cells die. Where is this vitamin K found, really? Lots and lots of vegetables. I have been to hospitals, this is real major hospitals that they treat cancer patients and amazingly when you look at their food menu you see five pages of desserts and some of them even include wine in their uh, in their menus to me that means that we are pushing them to die faster quicker and we are promoting their death in other words we are promoting their illnesses so don't worry about your food. Yeah, each, each, you know, you're dying anyway. You know, we don't know how many months you have left to live. So eat your cookies, eat your candy, you know, have your milkshakes. Don't worry about that. Once the body pH goes into acidity, the blood is unable to transport oxygen and the whole metabolism goes into a fermentative situation instead of oxidative energy production. And the only thing tissues and cells can do with fermentative energy is grow and split and grow and split and grow and split. That's cancer. And we can now prove that virtually every patient who comes in with cancer has a pH below seven, acidity, and within one week on the Gerson therapy, the pH is above seven. And they're healing, and tumors shrink, and pain goes away. Okay, it's that simple. If we eat lots of coffee and hamburgers and chocolate and sweets and desserts and packaged foods and chemically laden foods, our body's going to be acidic because the body, you're, you're straining the body tremendously. You're asking the body to do unreasonable acts of biochemistry.
what if 99% of all disease is nothing more than an opportunity to discover house cleaning? You're going to, uh, to thrive because you're eating, hopefully, about an 80% raw, 20% cooked diet, if you can. I mean, this is ideal. Uh, very, very difficult for a lot of people because you have to change your habits pretty radically. But uh, that type of diet will heal your body, literally. It will heal it because the raw vegetables have the ability to cleanse every organ in your body, to detox it, basically. The Gerson therapy, first of all, sees and understands disease as coming from two basic major factors, toxicity and deficiency. And in order to heal, we have to deal with both those factors as effectively and fast as possible. Deficiency being the damaged food, the toxic food, the food that's grown on artificial fertilizer, the food that processed and canned and jarred and pickled and preserved and all of that is deficient in nutrients. Secondly, toxicity from all the poisons that are sprayed on the, uh, on the soil and uh, in the water and in the air and uh, all of the other toxins. We have to deal with both those factors and we're able to do that extremely well. We avoid anything that's toxic and unnatural. Everything that's used on the Gerson therapy is organic, freshly grown, freshly prepared, nothing is canned, jarred, pickled, preserved, frozen, bottled, uh, emulsified, or anything like that. There are no chemical additives. So everything is fresh and living. Well, uh, the, the question about how long will this change take place, and the answer is how serious the crisis is. As crises mount, time changes. That when we are really up against the wall and we don't have 40 years for change, then change will have to happen much faster. So crisis is the drive force of evolution. And the crises that we're facing are causing us to make changes that we don't have 40 years to wait anymore. In 40 years, if we continue what we're doing, we'll be really on the edge of human extinction on this planet. As science has already told us within 40 years, the fish that we use for food will be fished out of the ocean. So imagine a world in 40 years where we don't even have ocean to feed us anymore. A completely different world. We don't have the time. Crisis will accelerate change and we are now in a very rapid acceleration of new vision, new belief, and new models of health. A lot of people don't even like to mention the word cancer because they associate it with death. I'm here to tell you that cancer does not equate death and that you can uh, reverse cancer and you can live with cancer for a very long time with excellent quality of life. We have patients that were told they were going to die in six months or a year. They're alive after 20 years and some of them still have cancer. So cancer does not have to be a death sentence and there are many options for patients out there if they study sufficiently uh, for them to uh, live with cancer or even reverse it. Anybody ever tells you your body turned on you, slap him in the face and walk out. Your body will never turn on you. Your body loves you. You have 10,000 trillion cells and they all have a job to perform and they love performing it. And if you help along and support your body's innate ability to heal, cancer is curable now.